Amen. You know, the truth is that we all make mistakes, right? We've all taken some wrong turns. We've all made some misjudgments. Anybody? Am I the only one here? <laughs> yeah, we all have. And, you know, and, and sometimes it takes a little while to get back on track, you know, and it's about making the, the right decisions. One thing that I find a lot of comfort in when we make wrong decisions and find us in a pl- find ourselves in a place where we wish that we weren't, and this is what we're, we're talking about this, these, this, this month and these next four couple more weeks, is learning from our mistakes. This is what I find comfort in, is in Romans 8.28 it says this, and we know that all, God causes all things to work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to their purpose to them. You know, no matter what you're going through, no matter what mistakes, I just want to start this off by saying this, no matter what you have gone through, no matter the mistakes that you've made, no matter if you find yourself in the wrong direction, going, you feel like you're going the wrong way, or you've not arrived where you need to go to, No matter what it is, the bad things, the hurts, the pains, God uses all that to get you to go, get you to where you've got to go. God has designed you with a purpose. God has a plan for your life. And he always knows how to get you from whatever point A to point B is. And all that stuff in between, he uses that to get you to your destination. All those hurts, all those things that you experience in your childhood, God uses them. And I, and I often say this, uh, it's easier to see God in the rearview mirror than it is in the windshield. Because when we look back at our lives, we look at some of those mistakes and those decisions that we made, even those hurts and all those pains, we, we can look back at it all and see how God used all that to mold us and to shape us and to who we are today. Can anybody agree with that today? You ever watch anybody mess up real bad? <laughs> you just kind of cringe. You're like, oh man, I wish they didn't do that, you know? And, and sometimes we're, it's not like in, like in a judgmental way, but we have a, a heart of compassion, and we're like, you know, I, I just wish they didn't do that. And, and, and some are more serious than other people. You know, uh, well, this past week, I was I, I, I got home from the office. I'm sitting down, just kind of relaxing. I, I'm scrolling through Facebook, and then a fail video comes on my news feed, so I figured I'd check it out. And, and as I'm watching it, Ga- Be- um, Lexi, she crawls up on my lap, and she sees all these mistakes that are happening. And every time a mistake would happen, she'd, she'd use her new word, it's broke. Every time something would happen, broke. Every time someone fell off a bike, broke. You know, every time something would happen, you know, and, and she and already she's getting to recognize what a mistake is. A couple of years ago, we watched on TV Miss Universe. Steve Harvey announced the wrong Miss Universe. What a horrible mistake. And we all cringed, didn't we? It got a lot of publicity, and he was embarrassed, but I love his sense of humor and how he just kind of bounces back from things like that. But uh, it's easy to laugh and cringe all at the same time, but what about our everyday life? What about our life where we are right now? What are those things that we did in our lives? We're looking back right now. I mean, I, I'm just cringing that that even happened, and, and we just wish it, we, it, things could have been a little bit different. You see, the thing that, is, that I love is that it's, it's much easier to learn from other people's mistakes than to make it ourselves. It's easier in the sense that we don't have to experience the pain and the hurt that somebody else went through if we only learn from what somebody else did. But often, Our greatest lessons come from the hurts and the pains that we do experience. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have an opportunity, and even through God's word, to learn from the mistakes of other people. And if we'll do that and we'll and we'll gain wisdom and we'll and we'll and we'll and we'll and we'll we'll seek God in, in situations, we can learn from other people's mistakes. How many times have we looked from the outside into a situation and we learn, We wish that we learned from other people's mistakes? You know, when someone close by, their, their marriage went terribly wrong. And we find ourselves in the same situation and we wish, man, I wish that I learned from my brother's mistake. I wish that I learned from my, from my, from my friend's mistake. 
Maybe a friend of yours or somebody close to you, somebody in your family, they're, they're going through a, a time of financial ruin. It just seems like that the whole world is falling apart, and it was. And, and now you find yourself in that same place, and you're saying, man, I wish that I'd learned from their mistake. Your life fell apart, and I wish I took precautions. Or maybe it's when someone else has treated you wrong in, in the past, and you find yourself right now treating other people wrong. Maybe somebody else hurt you, and now you're finding it that, 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 man, you're hurting other people. You haven't learned from other people's mistakes. So we all have areas of our life that we wish were different, you know, especially entering this new year, 2018. I mean, we had things in 2017 that we wish that we had got done. We had a direction for our life. We, 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 we kind of knew where we were going. We find ourselves in 2018, and we're like, wow. It just seems like I'm right where I started. I, I started to go in the right direction, but, but this happened and that happened, and this distraction came by, and it seems like I'm going in the wrong direction, and it, it's seeming to take longer to get where I want to go than I had anticipated. We look back on this past year when we should have taken, taken that opportunity that we should have, we, we should have taken opportunity of. We, we, we shouldn't have, maybe haven't taken that, that relationship for, for granted. Maybe we should have made better financial decisions. Maybe I shouldn't have said those, those hurtful words. You feel like maybe you took some wrong turns. You were going in the right direction. You, you started out the year, and it was, it was going great, and, 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 you, and you, you had a vision, you had a plan, you, you had a goal, but you took some wrong turns. I mean, it may not have been intentional. They, did, they could have just been some mistakes. But what I love is that despite our mistakes, God uses all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He uses all of that to, to propel you into his destiny for your life. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose. And he knows what he is doing. All those bad things may not they're, not, they're not from God, but God knows how to use all those things. You know, back in Joseph, he was sent in the prison back in the Old Testament, falsely accused, thrown in the prison, and later got out of prison, became the, 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 the second in command in all of Egypt. And what he said to, to his brothers, who, who are the ones that sold him into slavery, and it was kind of their fault, he said to them, what you meant for evil, God used it for my good. And there's some evil that might have happened in your life, some things that may have just not have been fair, some mistakes maybe even. But God uses all those things for his good. He didn't do it, but he sure knows how to use those things to get you to where you've got to go. And sometimes we feel like we've lost our direction. We feel like we're lost. I know what God has called me to do. I know the plan. I feel like I know the plan that God got, got spoken to me before. But I'm not where I need to be. Maybe you feel like God's spoken to your life. He gave you a glimpse of your destiny. He gave you a, a glimpse of your purpose. And he gave you a hope of your promised land. And your promised land doesn't have to look like anybody else's. We have preconceived notions of what that promised land should look like. But I believe that God has a promised land, has a, has a purpose, and a destiny for every single child of God in this place. And today, this is week two of our, our series, and I want to call this message series, this message today, Journey to the Promised Land. How do we get to our promised land? And actually, what we're going to be focusing on what are the, what's the biggest hurdle to get to our promised land? When we feel like we're lost, when we feel like we've gone the wrong direction, how do we get back on track? 
Today I want to talk about a story that happened 3,000 years ago. It's more than a story. It's a fact of history. The Jewish people, the children of Israel, they were enslaved in, in Egypt. They were enslaved for, for 400 years. They were mistreated. They were abused. They were, they were given unfair quotas to, 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 to fulfill. They were in slavery to, to, to Pharaoh to, to just do whatever he will. There was actually about the, the population of the children of Israel was equal to the population of Chicago in the land of Egypt. And I want to talk about their journey to the promised land, their promised land. And I believe there's a mistake that they made that we all can learn from. Because you know what? It's better to learn from somebody else's mistakes than to make them ourselves, right? In 2 Corinthians, it says that these things were written for us as examples, actually specifically talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt in the Exodus. And there's some things that we can look at that we can, that we can use and not make those mistakes and avoid those, those obstacles in our lives that are keeping us from where God wants us to go. Those things, we find ourselves lost, we find ourselves, we've lost direction, but how do we get back on track? We're going to be talking about Exodus 16. We're going to go into Exodus 16, verses um, two through two through four here, and we're gonna we're gonna read that. But I want to give you a summary of that before we before we read on. Basically, the children of Israel they turned an eleven day journey into a forty year eleven day journey into a forty year journey. Talk about taking wrong turns. Talk about losing direction. God told Moses to save his people and, he, and to deliver the people out of, out of the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt where they were unfairly treated and they were, they, were, they were slaves in a land that was not their own. They had moved down to Egypt during a time of famine 400 years earlier where, where Joseph, Joseph and his brothers found provision in a time of famine. I mean, these were God's people. In the midst of hardship, God, God provided for them time after time. He, he, he prospered them despite the, the oppression, the bondage that they were in. But God had called Moses to, to free the people from Egypt and bring them to the promised land, a land filled with milk and honey, God said, a land called Canaan. And he said, it's yours. I'm going to bring you there, and it's going to be your land forever. And the people of Israel would, would, would establish a nation there. And it wasn't an easy task for Moses. Moses had made, made some mistakes himself. He knew how, that God had called him to do this and made some mistakes on the way. And it, it took maybe a little bit longer than what he thought it would take. But here's Moses, 80 years old. He takes on the task of leading the people of Israel, out of slavery into the land of Canaan, their promised land. Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go. Pharaoh loved having the free labor. Pharaoh loved having these people who were bringing blessing to his land because, you know, God blesses his people. His chosen people are blessed in a very special way. And, and Pharaoh loved, he loved taking part in that blessing. And he wasn't going to let them go. But Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. And he, he went to him 10 times and said, let my people go. And time and time again, Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. And, and every time, God would send a plague to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. You won't let the people go? I'm going to send plagues upon your land. We turn the water into blood. There's frogs, there's flies, there's boils, there's, there's fiery hail, there's locusts, there's darkness, and then there's still one more. So nine times Moses went to Pharaoh, and this last time, Moses said, God told me to tell you, let my people go. And if you don't, there's one more plague. Every firstborn in the land 
when the angel of death passes over, will die. But God told Moses to tell his people, the children of Israel, to get ready to leave, pack your belongings and prepare a meal. You're going to have lamb for dinner tonight. Be sure when you prepare that lamb to take the blood and put it on the doorpost and on every doorpost, the, the blood of the lamb, of, a, of a, a spotless lamb over the doorpost. And every doorpost that has the blood of a lamb on it, the angel of death will pass over and the firstborn will not die in that home. And the Jewish people still celebrate the Passover to this day, 3,000 years later. So the angel of death passed over the, the homes of the children of Israel and all the land of Egypt, and not one firstborn in the, in the, in the children of Israel was touched. But Pharaoh's son had died. And finally, he let the people go. They came out of Egypt, a place of bondage, a place of slavery. And they had become accustomed to the slavery. They had become accustomed to where they were. But, but, but they, they heard this new hope that there's a, there's a place flowing of milk and honey for them. A place of prosperity, a place of blessing. But little did they know it wasn't just going to come easily. It wasn't going to come without God doing a work inside of them. How many people know that when God has blessing for you, there's often a process that he brings you through to get to the blessing? He leads you down a path to develop you, to bring you to a place where you can receive the blessing. So here's the children of Israel. They're leaving the land of Egypt, and they see God do the miraculous. They see God do things that they've never seen anything like before. And they're leaving Israel, they're leaving Egypt, they go to the land flowing with milk and honey, and they come to the, the first impossibility, because you know what? Pharaoh was having second thoughts. Pharaoh was saying, no, I'm going to get them back here. So they're chasing them, and they're chasing the, the children of Israel, and they stand before an impossibility in their life, and it's the Red Sea. And Moses strikes the Red Sea and imparts, and the children of Israel, they, 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 they cross on dry land. And when every single one of them crossed, they came in and killed the Egyptian armies. So they brought, then they were brought to Mount Sinai, and the Ten Commandments were given, and, they, and, and God led them through the wilderness, through a, a, a pillar by fire at night and a cloud by day. And they saw the miraculous. They saw many great things. God provided for them manna every day to eat. Manna literally means, what is it? They saw this, this stuff fall from the sky that they collected to, 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 to eat, and they said, what is it? And they continued to call it, and that's what manna means. What is it? And they got tired of manna one time, and, and God, God sent them some quail. Here, you want, some, you, want some, you want something, some meat to eat? I'll send you some quail. And a couple times they got, they got thirsty, and God said, hey, Moses, strike the rock, and, and water will flow out of that rock. Another time, they, he said, Moses, speak to the rock. And, and Moses struck the rock two times instead because he was so frustrated at the people for their unbelief. And that prevented Moses from entering into the promised land. We can learn from that. But despite that, God provided for them. They saw the wonderful works of God. They saw God's faithfulness in their life. So what did the children of Israel do? It says in verse 16, chapter 16, verse 2 through 4, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. Here in the, in the desert, all we're eating is manna. Once in a while, he'll throw us some quail, but man, manna every single day. I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting tired of this. And At least in Egypt, we sat around pots of meat. We had more than enough to eat. We ate all the food that we wanted. But you brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So what was their mistake? 
and what can we learn from? This is a common mistake that many of us make when we are entering, trying to, to enter into the promised land, enter into our destiny, enter into the purpose that God has for us. This is something that seems so minor, but has very, very strong and powerful spiritual implications. They grumbled and they complained. Here's the deal. I mean, if you want to, if you want to be divisive, if you want to hurt the heart of God, if you want to drive people away, if you want to hurt people, do what most people keep doing. Keep complaining. If you want to make an impact, if you really truly want to make a difference, if you want to have influence in this world, choose not to. Many of us, we rationalize it, we excuse it, we justify it. But it really has spiritual implications in our own lives. But, you know, if we want to honor God and really make a difference in a significant way, I want you to join me in 2018 and make a decision not to complain. You know, we have a decision to make. We can, we can, we can be ungrateful for what God has given us and the people that he's brought into our life and, and the job that we have and even our boss and our leaders. Or we can choose to be ungrateful. And what the children of Israel did is even though God was bringing them somewhere great, they, they chose to see the negative things. They, they got so focused on the situation that they're in right now, and they began to grumble and complain about where God has brought them. I mean, they saw God's power. They saw they, and God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, and God was bringing them to a land that he had promised. But, you know, it wasn't happening quite the way that they had planned, the way that they thought that it should have happened. Are there some things in your life that, man, it didn't happen just the way that you had planned, and you thought it was going to turn out totally different, and, man, it's taking you longer to get from point A to point B than what you even imagined? So here's the children of Israel. It's taking them longer to get to where they've got to go. It, it, it's, it, it, it's, taking, it, it's, it's happening more differently. They, didn't, we weren't, they weren't really expecting this process that they had to go through. They didn't expect this journey. Maybe in the beginning of 2017, you'd set some goals, maybe some, some, some New Year's resolution, and, and you thought that things were going to change, things were going to be different, and, and here it is, 2018, and you're like, looking back at your resolutions, wow, what, what happened to those? Not too much has changed. Man, it's taking longer than I thought. Man, it's, it's, it's not happening the way that, that I thought. You know, the, my, 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 the, my, my, my marriage getting better and, 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 and getting healthy. Man, I thought that over this year we'd get to a, a healthier place. Man, I, I thought I'd be out of debt already. I had this plan in place, and now I'm finding myself not quite there. I wanted to get out of debt. I wanted to pay off my credit cards, but here I am right now. It's taking longer than I thought. It's not happening the way that I thought it would happen. Maybe I was going to start my business this year. And it's not happening. That promotion at my job. I've been working so hard and I've been taking these steps and getting additional training and education. And, and man, it, it's just not happening the way that I thought it would happen. Maybe that relationship, it's taking longer for it to heal. It's not happening the way that I thought. Maybe you thought that you'd buy a home in 2017 and you're still there where you didn't think that you would be. You had goals, you had plans. There was this promised land set before you. And it's, tempted, it's tempting to feel frustrated and maybe even get upset at ourselves for where we are. And sometimes we condemn ourselves for where we're at. Maybe because it's, it's, it's the wrong decisions that we made. Maybe there were, they were just stupid mistakes, or maybe they were just done unintentionally because we just didn't know. But we feel frustrated, we feel upset when we're blaming ourselves, or maybe we're blaming someone else in our lives, and, and, and it's tempting to let doubt settle in. Will this ever happen? Will I ever arrive where I thought I was going to arrive. Am I going to ever get to where I was going? 
Because right now it's not looking like it. And right now it looks like just like I'm going around in circles in my life. And, and, and essentially that's what the children of Israel did. They went in circles for 40 years. An 11 day journey should have just taken 11 days, took them 40 years because they didn't learn one very important lesson. They grumbled and they complained. They grumbled and they complained. And when we grumble and complain, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves at the center of the story. It's all about me, what I want, the way that I think it should happen. And we're not coming from a place of faith and trust in Jesus and God's plan and purpose for our life. We're pushing to the side the lessons and the things that God wants to show us. We're ignoring the growth that God is trying to grow us in in our lives. And we choose to focus on what's not happening. Isn't it so much easier to focus on what's happening and the negativity in our life, right? A thousand great things. Yes, you know that. I know it too. Because so many things can happen Good things can happen, but we zero in on that one thing. I know a pastor did a survey of married couples. He was heavily involved in marriage counseling. He took a survey over the years of all the the couples that came into his office for, for marriage counseling. And it would always be about something small. He'd tell them both right out, the good things, and the bad things. And nine times out of ten, the list of good things were a mile long, and there's only a few bad things. But they chose to zero in on things that really don't make a difference. They chose to get a divorce because he left his socks on the floor, or he left the dirty dishes in the sink, or, 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 you know... But don't we do that? It's easier, easier for us to zero in on what is wrong than what is right. See, God has blessed us, and God is doing some amazing things in our lives. But we'll focus on the pain. We'll focus on the hurt. We'll focus on what's going wrong rather than what's going right. And we feel frustrated. And we look back and we're tempted to think, why did I start this journey? Shouldn't I, should, I, I probably should have just stayed where I was. You know, uh, I should have stuck with something that I was used to. Maybe in 2017, you had that vision and you knew where you were going. You believed that God spoke to you and he showed you what, what his plan for your life is. That business, that ministry, that marriage, that, that purpose for your life, that, you, that financial position that you thought you'd be in. But today, in 2018, you're not there yet. You're not where you want it to be, and you thought you'd be there sooner. And that's what was going on with the children of Israel. They were frustrated that they weren't in the promised land, and they started to grumble and complain against Moses and against God. And against against what was going on in their their life. I want to talk about one of the greatest hindrances to blessing and progress in our life. I want to talk about the cost of complaining. I think it's a very practical message for us as we start out this new year, as we make decisions and choices in our own life to choose not to complain. Choose to focus on what God is doing in our life, to to focus on the blessing of God and and choose to to, 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 just to to worship God in all of our circumstances, no matter what we're going through. We have reason to rejoice. We have reason to worship God. We have have reason to praise him for, for what's going on in our life. Not everything has to be easy and going perfect. But the cost of complaining, number one, complaining offends the heart of God. Numbers 11, 1 through 2. Now the people complained about their hardships and the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. And then fire, well, this is serious, wow. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of their camp. 
serious business. God really dislikes complaining. But yet we find it so easy to complain. You mean, there's entire groups and friendships that are built about around complaining. <laughs> You know, you go to the local, the local coffee shop and you, and you hear a group of people there that every time you're there, they hear them complaining about the weather, complaining about their team, complaining about their job, complaining about this and complaining about that, and they have a whole lot of fun doing it. <laughs> and they're best friends. <laughs> but what complaining does is it keeps ourselves focused on us, our problems our situation. You see, anytime we become focused on our situation, our problem, our circumstance, we're getting our eyes off from God. The Bible tells us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Be focused on him. No matter our circumstance, no matter what's going on around us, it might seem like, 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 man, I'm really messing up here, and it's just things aren't going the way that I thought. But Lord, in the midst of it, I'm going to trust you that all those mistakes, man, I, I repent of all that stuff. I don't know what happened there, but, but I'm trusting you to move me forward and give me the insight, give me the revelation, give me what I need to keep on moving forward. Because complaining, you're just staying in the past. You're staying. You're, you're, you're stationary. You can't move forward. You can't complain your way to success. But you can believe God for the best. Nobody ever got successful by being negative. Nobody got successful by being negative. If you look at similarities of people who have become successful in their life, they have an optimistic outlook. They tend to find the good in situations. They, they look and they see what's going right. And, and, and it might be hard. It might be difficult. But this is what's going right. And this is what I'm going to zero on. And this is what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to be thankful for it. Because the, the thing is, every, there's always going to be bad things that are happening in our life. But it's a matter of, are we willing to shift our perspective? This is a perspective shift. A conscious decision of how we think. The Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of the mind. It says, do not be conformed by the ways of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means we've got to, we've got to shift our thinking. The word repent actually means to, to shift our thinking, to turn from our sin and think differently about it. And maybe there's some things in our lives that we need to shift our thinking about. You with me today? My desire for you is to have a successful 2018. I want to see you advance. I want to see you prosper. I want, you, I want to see you become closer and closer to all that God has created you to be. And for some of us, this might be a key issue in our life that's keeping us from advancing. It's keeping us from that promotion. It's keeping us from that success. It's keeping us from that relationship getting, getting healed. It's keeping us from, from that, that, that position of prosperity in our life. Whatever that means. It's so easy to focus on our circumstance. But we need to make a choice to trust God, to focus on what he is doing in our life. Secondly, complaining carries significant consequences. Numbers 14, 27 through 28 and 30 says, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? 
I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So, so tell them, as surely as I live, not one of you, listen to this, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home. Serious. Wow. See, my kids know that the moment they start whining, the answer is no. <laughs> no, there's no whining in this house. If you want something, please do not whine, because the answer is going to be no, right off the bat. So if you, if you don't want something, go ahead and whine. You know, and, and, and God, of course, he's full more of compassion and love than what Pastor Jeff may be sometimes. But, 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 but at the same time, I, I think he, he operates in the same way. He wants us to be thankful. He wants us to come from a position of thankfulness and gratefulness for all that he's done for us. Because, you know, God has done great things in our life. God has provided for us. God has blessed us. The very, the very, the very fact that we, we, we were born in the United States of America or we're here, we came here from a different country, and we're, we're here in the United States of America, we're blessed. I don't know if you've been to a third world country. I have. You're blessed. You're blessed you can eat three times a day or more. <laughs> you're blessed that you don't have to go two days without food because you don't know where it's coming from. You're blessed that you live in a, a house, not a shack. <laughs> you're blessed that you're not wearing clothes that we send over there that have holes in it. God has done so much good for us in our lives. He's blessed us. He's provided for us. And sometimes it gets hard. And man, it just seems like we're like that far from collapse or that far from going over the edge. But if we shift our perspective, what is God doing? What's God doing in my life? And I'm sure that if you made that list of all the things that are going wrong in your life and, and what God has blessed me with and what he is doing in my life, I, I'm sure that that list of the, the blessings and the goodness will be a mile long and you'll just have this, a few things on your list of what's wrong. But we zero in on them and we grumble and we complain. And when we grumble and we complain, we make ourselves be at the center of the story where Jesus needs to be at the center of our life and the center of our story. Write this down if you'd like. It's not going to be on the screen, but grumbling and complaining is to the devil what worship and praise is to God. Man, <laughs> I didn't like that when I heard it either. <laughs> Got that one late last night. See, worship comes from a place of faith and thanksgiving. When we worship God, we, we thank him for his goodness, and we, we, we worship him for who he is. But complaining comes from a place of unbelief and ungratefulness. Because what we're saying when we complain is that, God, you didn't do it good enough in my life. God, you didn't provide good enough. No, God, you, you, you didn't give me the right job. You didn't give me the right employees. You, you didn't give me the right opportunities. And what we're saying is that, God, you didn't get it right. But I'm setting myself up as God, and I'm saying, do it differently now. It needs to be done differently. But maybe if we'll take that shift of perspective and look at what God is doing in our life, how is God molding me? How is God shaping me? What is, what is God speaking into my life? What are, those, what are those things that I need to change to get to where I've got to go? I think things are going to be better. So let's talk about overcoming complaining. We kind of went pretty heavy there for a little bit, didn't we? All right, let's talk about overcoming complaining. So what I'm going to talk about is the, the what of overcoming, the why of overcoming, and we're going to talk about the how of overcoming. We're going to be looking
looking at, at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read some verses through 14 and 18 and, and read, a, read a section. We're going, to, we're going to look into it and talk about it and see what God has to say for us in there. First of all, the what of overcoming is do not complain. Just make a decision not to complain. Decide with God's help not to complain. Maybe your prayer today is, God, help me with this. Because, <laughs> you know, it's too easy, and I, it kind of feels good to complain. But you know what? After you complain, it doesn't feel so good. It feels good in the moment. God, help me not to complain, because I know that, th- 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 that this, this is really having an impact on me spiritually. It's having an impact on my relationships. It's, it's having an impact on my job. And, I, and, and, and it could be quite that you're not getting the promotion that you're looking for because of your complaining. If we shift our perspective and have a, maybe we come from a place of faith and optimism and, and positivity, I believe that God can accomplish great things through us. But what do we do? Man, my boss, that guy, man, he always says this. And can you believe he did that? Or, man, you know, my husband, he, man, he just doesn't get it. My wife, my kids, man, they're just brats. We need to speak life life into our situation. The Bible says that, 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 that the, the power of death in life are in the power of our tongue. Your words carry weight, they carry power. And we need to be speaking that, that life into our situation. We need to be speaking that life into our family. We've got to be speaking that life into our job. You can't get good from negativity. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Negativity plus negativity doesn't equal good. So we got to decide with God's help not to complain. See, complaining is putting us at the center of the story, and, and Jesus needs to remain the center of that story. In Philippians 2.14, it says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. That word, that word everything, if you look it up in the Greek, you know what it means? Everything. Everything. Man, Pastor, are you saying everything at my job that I have to do, my boss tells me to do, do it without grumbling? Compl- yeah, everything. Everything. Every responsibility at home, yeah. Even when it's hard, yeah. Without grumbling and complaining. See, I believe that God has has placed us where we are for such a time as this. He's brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this. And he has a a plan, he has a purpose for who you are and where you are at that moment. He has ordained you and ordained where you are from the foundations of the world. And it's our responsibility to steward that. God has given us this day. God has given us this opportunity. God has given us this job. God has given us this church. God has given us this family, this home, this relationship. And it's our job to steward that day, to steward that opportunity. You know what steward means? It means that it's somebody else's, but he's given it to us. And we're going to manage it very well. So we're going to steward our money. We're going to steward our job. We're going to steward these opportunities that come our way. But what if we shifted our perspective? Instead of grumbling, complaining about having to to pick up somebody else's slack at work or doing something that that might not be our job, and and we look at those things as opportunities to serve God and to glorify Him and to serve God with excellence. We're tempted to say, man, it's not fair. But we could say, man, I don't care. I'm looking at this thing that I'm grumbling, complaining about, that I was grumbling, complaining about, and I'm going to use it for an opportunity to serve God and to bring him glory because I'm refusing to complain, and I'm going to do what I've got to do to, to bring him glory in my life. I'm refusing that. I'm refusing to complain. I'm refusing the negativity. I'm refusing to be offended. Everybody's offended these days. Refuse it at all costs. Choose.
choose not to be offended. You can choose not to be offended, you know. I guess that's another message, but we'll get back to this. <laughs> it's tempting to say it's not fair. It's tempting to, to say, you know, somebody else should be doing that, or they're, they're not doing it right, and, 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 we, and, we, and we begin to grumble and we complain. The Bible says that in all that we do, do it as unto the Lord. Even those things that we don't want to do, those things that are hard, those things that we feel are somebody else's responsibility, we have an opportunity. Now it's fallen in our lap to do it as unto the Lord without grumbling and complaining and do it with excellence to bring God glory. What if we shifted our thinking from believing that worship is only a half an hour of singing on Sunday where we sing songs? To realize that every action, every moment is an opportunity to bring worship to Jesus. What if we had that shift of focus? What if we had that that shift of perspective? What I do for my family, that's an opportunity to bring glory to the Lord. What I do for the church, that's that's an opportunity to bring glory to the Lord. What I do at my job, even for my boss, that's an opportunity to bring glory to the Lord. Because in all I do, I do it unto the glory of God. I'm doing it all for Him. Everything I do is an act of worship, or can be an act of worship. Or we can grumble, or we can complain. We don't have to do it, we get to do it. We exist to glorify Him. And you might be saying right now, I'm choosing right now not to grumble and complain. Ephesians 4, 9, 4, 4, 29 says, Let not any unwholesome talk, what does that mean, come out of your mouths? Does mean compl- does mean cursing, yeah. It means complaining too. Anything that is not beneficial, anything that will not encourage other people. And that's something that we've all got to look at. We've all, every single one of us, we struggle with that because it's so easy to go down that negative road. Do not let any unwholesome talk. Man, if you won't let your kids say it, don't say it yourself. That's the rule in our house. If you hear daddy say it, you can say it. (laughs) Keeps me accountable, right? but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You see, complainers, they have what you call spiritual bad breath. <laughs> they come around and you just kind of kind of keep your distance. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if we really want to impact people, we really want to influence people, we speak words of life, of encouragement. We want to build relationships. We want to build friendships. If, we, if, we, if, if God has brought people into our life, if we want our, our family situation to get better, if we want well, better relationships within the body of Christ, we need to choose to speak life and encouragement into people instead of having spiritual bad breath. People who are encouragers, people who, who speak life are never lacking friends. They're, they're never lacking influence of other people, influencing other people in a positive way. So let's talk about the why. So you can become more like Christ. So do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Complaining is just something that God wants us to stay away from. Come on, Mike, we're going to close this up. And complaining is something that can impact us tremendously spiritually. Luke 6.45 says this, For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. See, we can gauge the condition of our heart by what is coming out of our mouth. Because out of our heart, our mouth speaks. We can catch ourselves sometimes. We're saying the wrong things. We're... Or we're going down that negative road in our in our in how we're speaking. What I'm not saying here 
is that we've got to police other people how they talk, okay? I've been around circles like that. It's our job to show grace, but take personal responsibility for who we are and for what God has called us to do. For out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. And I believe that complaining is not a sign of spiritual health. I believe that if, if, if this year is going to be different than other, any other year that we've lived before, we can't keep on doing the things that we've kept on doing. We can't keep on doing things the same way. Something's got to change. And for some of us, it just might be choosing to not complain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the road that you lead us down. We thank you for the opportunities, Lord, that you bring into our lives. We thank you for the blessing, Lord. And as we are in these, this first month of 2018, Lord, we're making a declaration, Lord. We're making a choice to worship you and rejoice in all circumstances. I remember Paul, he was locked up in prison for preaching the gospel, but he said, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. He said, rejoice in all circumstances as he's bound up in chains, ready, awaiting his execution. Lord, give us that same heart. That despite the hardship, despite the pain, we'll choose to worship you Lord, there may be a promised land awaiting us, Lord, and today we recognize that that one thing that's keeping us from entering into that promised land might be our, our grumbling and complaining, and today we repent, we turn, and Lord, we choose to worship you. We choose to focus on, the, on what's right. We choose to focus on the positive. We choose to be faith-filled, spirit-empowered, and align our thoughts to your word. Maybe you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you're, you're here today, and man, complaining has really been a stronghold in your life, and you want help. I want you to raise your hand. You want God's help. Yes, 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 yes. This is the word for God from God for us today. I want you to take a moment and just talk to God for a little bit. God, I turn from that. Lord, I, I choose. I'm, 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 I'm making a shift of my perspective now. I'm, 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 Lord, it, it might have been hard, but now, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm shifting my perspective, Lord. I'm, I'm doing it all for your glory, and that means I'm going to do things just a little bit different. tell you something. God had to preach this to me first. I'm not preaching you a lesson that just because I'm giving you a lesson, but God had to do something in my heart before this could come to you. And today you're making that decision. You're making that choice. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a shift of perspective. And today, I'm making that choice. And as an act of faith, as a step of faith, I'm going to ask you to, to get up out of your seat and come up to the altar and say, God, I'm making this declaration. This is serious business, God. I mean, this is serious business. Life is going to change. And my act of faith, by coming up here right now, is a symbol of my faith. I don't care what anybody thinks, but I'm standing before you. And if that's you, I want you to come up right now, right now, and we're going to worship God together. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let's worship him. I want you to begin to reflect on the goodness of God in your life. I want you to begin to reflect on what God is doing. Forgetting the former in the past, as Isaiah says. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Springs of water spring up in dry land. 
Behold, I am doing a new thing in your life. And I believe today is the first step into your promised land. All right, let's stand. Let's worship him today. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. Yes. Let's worship him today. Yes. Hallelujah.